So derived data types. So so far we've we've uh, we've talked about you know communication, uh, send and receive, point to point communication, collective communication. Now we're going to spend a little more time talking about how MPI deals with uh, the the type of data that's in in your buffers um, in your in your communication calls. So data types in MPI are uh, a fairly powerful interface. Um, but the, the high level uh, explanation is they allow you to kind of uh, to serialize and deserialize arbitrary data layouts into uh, more or less a message stream. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 again, the high level thing here is networks, uh, communication networks, interconnects provide kind of serial channels um, as well, and so do file systems, block devices. Um, and so, uh, uh, that's kind of, uh, uh, so MPI needs to take these data layouts and kind of convert them to uh, uh, messages, uh, which are uh, messages or files, which are essentially uh, serial channels. So we have lots of constructors to deal with um, uh, defining these data, data, type, uh, data layouts using, using the MPI data type uh, interface. Um, you, know, you, can, you can kind of recursively specify uh, data layouts. So just because you know you can define one uh, uh, data layout and then use another constructor to use that data layout as input to recursively kind of uh, add more and more information. Information. Uh, the, spec the specification is declarative. It, it, it you define you define the what to MPI. You leave MPI to kind of figure out the how. Um, which uh, which is uh, means that there's a huge optimization space that MPI can kind of exploit when when you tell it you know this is this is how my data is laid out MPI can can use that information hopefully to uh, to optimize how that data will be accessed by uh, by the library when it goes to uh, when it goes to communicate it but um, what this what this ends up uh, what is, what ends up happening is that it's not always uh, really easy to know how to use this interface well how to use the right constructors in order to get the you know maybe the best performance from your uh, in your application so so the, the next uh, uh, the next two slides are going to give you kind of a rule of thumb or some rules of thumb uh, uh, in, in how you can use the data type interface in MPI uh, hopefully to to uh, and you won't get kind of um, unexpectedly bad performance in your case. So uh, the, at the simplest level, there's MPI predefined data types, uh, like there were predefined operators in collective communication. We have predefined data types that essentially match the, uh, the language types that, uh, uh, that are supported in the, MP in the official MPI you know, interfaces, the C, C and Fortran interfaces. So you know, you have uh, a C int corresponds to this MPI int predefined data type, C float, MPI float, and so on. Fortran integers. So Fortran uses uh, 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 different integer, uh, or, or we differentiate Fortran integers from C, integer, uh, C integers. So where C uses MPI int, Fortran uses MPI integer. And then for more complex user created data types, we have, uh, we have routines that I'm gonna cover on the next few slides. Um, to, to construct uh, more complex things uh, using the API. So uh, a derived data type example, a user user defined derived data type example. So this is this is an illustration. We've got a buffer here, uh, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna look at how the data is laid out in the buffer. So so we can think of the color, the green and the blue blocks, as essentially um, Data that we're uh, we consider you know significant in this particular in this particular buffer, and we want we want MPI to be able to, to access it, maybe send or receive into these regions. So this is just a just an example here where you know you've got um, you know at the lowest level you've got a contiguous region of two two blocks here, two two green segments. Um, and this 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 is repeated uh, three times. So when you when you repeat 
uh, when you repeat a data type uh, where you know you have you have a um, the same amount of data and it's spaced out the same amount in each in each repetition. So in this case, we have two blocks of data starting every four um, uh, every four uh, uh, bytes, for instance. So just think of this as uh, these are individual bytes. Um, so we can create a vector type, an MPI vector type that basically says, here's my data and here's the stride between the start of, of, uh, of each contiguous block of data. Um, a little more general than a vector. Vector is, is you know, fairly, fairly well structured. Uh, you can make an index type. So an index type just says, I have you know, this many, uh, in this case, one, two, three, four, five blocks of blue data. And I'm, I'm going to give you an array of starting, uh, uh, starting positions of, or, or the positions of all these uh, bytes of data. And so that's, that's how you would create an indexed data type. And then you can also, uh, uh, you can also create a struct type, which at a, at a struct type, the property of, of uh, um, the unique property of struct, MPI uh, type create struct, is that you could have more than one input type. So in this case, you know, your contig and your vector type, all these green blocks are the same basic underlying type, same thing in indexed. Each one of these types is the same type of data, maybe an integer, something like that. Whereas a struct can take two different types and create a data, data layout that represents you know, multiple input types at the same time. <clears throat> so we're gonna walk through these APIs a little bit and show you, uh, show you kind of how they work. So contiguous, again, the simplest type. You have a count uh, for the number, the, number of, uh, uh, the number of elements of a particular type that are going to be represented by this contiguous type. You have an MPI data type, which is the old type. So at, at the lowest level, you're going to need to use some predefined data type um, as, the, as the old type. And, when you, and then you give a pointer to a new type handle so after you call this, after you call this function, you're going to get back a handle to a, your your new contiguous type that represents, you know, say, you know, uh, in this bottom example here, uh, seven seven blocks of old type, se seven seven uh, uh, instances of old type, all in a contiguous uh, um, memory region. Uh, we say that contiguous should not be used as the last type. Um, so, so what we're meaning here is if you're building up a hierarchy of types, you know, if you're recursively defining types, um, if, if the last thing you're doing is creating a contiguous type to then use in, in a communication operation, you're not really getting any benefit from that. Um, so uh, uh, we would recommend just using, it, foregoing the contiguous type creation and just using the last, uh, the last type you created with a count parameter because MPI kind of knows that, oh, okay, these, uh, uh, these particular data types are contiguous um, and we have this many of them. So, so that's, there's kind of no benefit to that. That's why we say you don't use it as the last type. Uh, MPI type vector. So like I touched on, on the, uh, um, the initial kind of example illustration. So we specify strided blocks of data of old type Again, input is your your input is the old type. So again, we have a count. So it's the number the number of uh, um, blocks. We have a block length. So how 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 many uh, um, how many uh, type elements they are uh, elements there are in a block. And so if you look at this illustration here, each each block is two. Uh, uh, two elements long, so the block length would be two in this case. Stride is again uh, how many how many instances. Uh, so in in MPI type vector, the stride is in units of the input data type. So in this case, uh, if if our array here is uh, again, I'm going to use in, I'm I'm going to use mainly integers for illustration purposes because that's that's kind of the, the easiest thing to think about. So if I have two integers here, 
and that, and and uh, uh, my stride in this case is going to be three, right? Because each each new uh, uh, instance of two integers starts three elements from the last uh, from the last block of of two integers. And so, if I had a vector here, I was defining. So I have uh, uh, in this case, I have three um, three blocks of length two. The stride is three, and my, my old type in this case might be integer, and I get back out a new type, um, new type handle that I can then use uh, uh, later on. And so we, we say this is usual for Cartesian uh, arrays. In fact, that's what our example is probably going to. Uh, that's what our example covers. So we'll, once we get to that, you'll you'll probably be want to be looking at uh, this API. But again, so and then down here we just have another kind of uh, um, multi-layered data layout where, in this case, the, the input type, the old type to your vector uh, definition is in fact this struct type. So you have two structs here, and then you have a stride of three structs where, where the next, uh, the next uh, um, element in your vector uh, starts. <clears throat> So in addition to the creation APIs uh, in MPI, so when, you, when you're describing your data layout, you also have type commit, type free, and type duplicate uh, APIs. So commit, uh, fairly straightforward. You have to commit the data type before you use it in a communication call. Um, so when we say, uh, uh, so that's what the bullet here says, only the ones that are used. So if you're, if you're just creating types in order to create other types, you only have to commit the, the, the type that you're intending to use, the last type, the type that you, you intend to use um, in say an MPI send operation. You don't have to commit all of the, all of the intermediate types um, because you know, at the end, MPI isn't gonna, is only, gonna, only cares about the last type that you created, the one that you're gonna give back to MPI in a communication call. MPI type commit, the idea here is that you're going to perform all that, you're hopefully performing heavy optimization at that point. Um, this isn't always the case in practice, but that's, that's the idea. Um, MPI type free. So once, once you're done, uh, um, once you're done with a type, you're going to want to free it in order to release resources uh, back to the MPI implementation. Because unless you free it, MPI doesn't know that you know, you might use it again, so it's going to keep whatever resources it allocated um, uh, to, uh, for that particular type around until until it explicitly knows from the user that it no longer needs it. Um, and then there's also this MPI type dupe uh, 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 API, which can duplicate a type. Um, and this is mainly uh, an abstraction used by libraries. If uh, you know, if you're writing in a, a library that uses MPI. Um, and may want to you know, uh, work on user-defined data types, they probably want to create their own copy of that so they don't have to worry about the user, say, freeing a data type when the library thinks it might, it might still uh, uh, be able to use it. Um, yeah, so uh, again, I'm not going to go into these slides in detail. H vector, uh, the difference between H vector and vector is that um, instead of the stride being specified in uh, uh, the number of elements of the old type, the stride is specified in bytes. Uh, the H stands for heterogeneous here, so you can kind of uh, you, you don't have a, a you're not not everything is done in terms of old old type. You can have kind of a, a non um, you can have a stride here of say you know. 11 as opposed to 12, even though if you were doing it in old type. Uh, index block. So uh, we talked about indexed a little bit. So in this case, you have blocks of data, blocks of two integers in this case, block length two. Um, but your, uh, your starting displacement in the, uh, in the buffer is kind of irregular. So you can just kind of give an array of displacements to the implementation, say, Here's where all my blocks start in my buffer, and MPI knows that's the case. Indexed is more general. So again, indexed just uh, 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 all block. It's, it's essentially uh, indexed block where each block is length one. 
Um, and so you give, uh, oh, sorry, no, I, I'm wrong. Each, uh, um, you can have an array of, so you, you actually specify the block length of each, uh, each piece of data um, as opposed to where the block length was consistent uh, for all pieces in, in uh, type index block. And as I said before, more getting, as I've been kind of going through this, we're getting more and more general, whereas MPI vector is really kind of structured and, and, and uh, has kind of fewer moving parts. Um, MPI type create struct is, is uh, basically the most general. So not only do we have an array of block lengths, we have an array of displacements. Um, we also have an array of types that the MPI uh, takes as input here to say, okay, well, maybe this is an MPI double and these are MPI ints uh, or vice versa, but this allows you to, to specify all this, uh, all this information to MPI. So again, you can, you can define really, really arbitrary layouts of data um, using these interfaces. Um, not that that's always a good idea, but it's possible. And so that's, you know, kind of, um, that's kind of uh, 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 what we're trying to get at here is you can go kind of crazy with these interfaces, but in general, the more general an API, the less optimization possibility um, MPI has when, when, when you go to commit that and use it later, uh, because that, that, that very, very general interface, um, it's, uh, it's, it's hard for MPI to kind of have any uh, uh, good way to, to understand it later when it goes to access the buffer. All right. And yeah, this, this also this MPI type create subarray, which is uh, kind of a convenience thing. It's again, it's something that the way MPI works is if, if, a, if a particular pattern keeps showing up in MPI applications, um, then there's a good chance that someone will come up with a with an API that uh, they'll present to the forum and say, "This is a this is a thing that happens a lot. Why doesn't MPI handle it for me so I don't have to you know re-implement this every time I go to um, when I go to write a new write a new code or or I can I can take the burden off of this uh, the burden of implementing this particular pattern um, away from application developers and make MPI do it you know hopefully once." Hopefully, in a good performant way, and that way it it, uh, um, it can be reused by by applications. So, so in this case, you can kind of create a subarray from your um, from your from your data set uh, that then MPI can can go ahead and uh, uh, use later on. So I went through this pretty quickly because I think I want to give folks uh, plenty of time for, for the hands-on. So we have until I think uh, uh, yeah noon where folks are going to take uh, take the next example, or, or sorry, we're going to try and build on the example we, we looked at before and, and use, uh, use the derived data type interface in order to, uh, um, uh, you know, improve the code to some degree. So. Just to summarize, derived data types are a sophisticated mechanism to describe really any layout of data in memory. Uh, your hierarchical construction allows them to be, you know, uh, uh, very complex. But those complex layouts require more, you know, uh, more complex constructions, and therefore may make make it harder for MPI to to optimize. Um, and so, I think as people have seen. Uh, or maybe some people have seen just from what I've seen in the chat and the, and the hardware session yesterday, um, MPIs might lag a bit in terms of performance if you're using the, if you're using derived data types. Uh, things are improving this area. Uh, you know, in our team and the MPitch team, we're uh, in the process of kind of uh, implementing a, a wholly new data type uh, engine that that does much better for common cases, um, whereas you know. Uh, I, th I would say in the past, MPitch and, and, and maybe other MPIs are really focused on correctness and handling all of the complexity that's possible to specify with the API. Um, in addition to being correct, we also want to optimize for, for common cases that applications uh, uh, commonly use. So things like vectors and stuff. We don't want people 
to, to uh, get disillusioned with MPI data types just because they see that they don't perform that well and then they abandon them completely. Uh, what, we, what we hope people do is use the data types if they think they're performing poorly, uh, contact your MPI vendor or your MPI implementer, um, let them know, hopefully give them, give them evidence to say, I can do this better. How come MPI does so much worse? I mean, we can take that as kind of a good um, uh, case that we can then try to optimize for and, and eventually you know, match or exceed the performance of kind of what you think is possible. Uh, with with uh, with your data, and so yeah, <clears throat> to get to the exercise, again we're doing the stencil code. We're going to uh, uh, so far we've used non-blocking communication, which is good, um, but we're manually packing and unpacking the data uh, before and after sending it, and we're gonna we're we're saying that's thumbs down. We're saying that's bad. Why don't we let MPI do that for us? So let's try and use derived data types. So we're going to specify the locations of the data instead of manually packing and unpacking it um, for before before and after communicating. So we just need to think about all right, what type of data do we need? What type of what what data type do we need to construct in order to uh, uh, let MPI handle that for us? So you know, if we think of our data laid out here, we've got our, our horizontal sections and our vertical sections. Uh, this is these are the, the sections we're, we're communicating to our neighbor processes. So think about what data type you need um, to 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 uh, 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 represent this layout of data, and how can I construct that um, in the uh, uh, in the example code in order to eliminate this manual packing and unpacking. So the exercise for you guys is to. Uh, Specify the location of your data using MPI data types such that manual packing is no longer required. We recommend you start from the non-blocking point-to-point stencil.c file we looked at earlier. And, and what you're essentially trying to do is work toward the solution, which is in derived data type, uh, the derived data type folder stencil example. So, so the idea here is, you know, basically take that packing and unpacking step and make it uh, uh, unnecessary through the use of the data type by, by creating data types instead and using those, handing those to MPI. So, so that's the exercise to you guys. If you have more questions or, or you want uh, you know, some, more, um, some more hints, like I talked about before, uh, vector type is important for Cartesian applications. So vector type is probably key to, key to this example. Um, but otherwise, I'll, uh, uh, I'll kind of uh, uh, drop down into the chat here uh, as folks ask, ask questions and try to answer them there. Um, but feel free to, to you know, unmute if you want to ask questions that way too. Can you move to the uh, next slide also that has some yeah. instructions, right? So it says start from, yeah, the, the stencil.c in the non-blocking uh, directory that we looked at previously and try to use derived data types as mentioned on the previous slide. I can, look, I can actually, I can do, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll drop down back into my terminal as well and, and kind of, Maybe go to the part of the code where where people should start making their uh, yeah yeah that'll be good. start making their modifications. Don't worry if you don't get through the whole example. You know it, this this will probably take you longer if, if this is your first time using derived data types. This will probably take you uh, longer than the, the time we have allotted here. But you can work on it over the break or lunchtime if you uh, if you if you have if you have the time then. So so yeah, I'm, let's start with pack. So I'm back in the non-blocking stencil dot, dot C here. So the first, uh, the, in this example, we use this pack data function. Uh, oops. So why don't I go? So why don't I go to the actual implementation of this pack data? So so what pack data is doing? 
So if you remember our alloc buffs function, where we allocated not only our, our two-dimensional uh, uh, array of data, but we also allocated our send and receive buffers. Um, and so what this is doing is it's actually going, um, it's going into the send, it's going into your uh, a old your two-dimensional array, and it's copying that data into your send buffers. Um, because then it's going to use these send s buff north, s buff south, and so on as inputs to the to the MPI I send and I receive calls. Um, so <clears throat> instead of doing this packing step, what we really want to do is just create a type once um, at the uh, um, sorry, I'm going to get back to my main here. So outside of the loop, what we really want to do is just create types once for maybe four types in this case, though, in all likelihood, you could probably define two. Um, but you want to have a type for, for your, you know, your North data exchange, your South data exchange, your, your West and East. And then <clears throat> you can replace, say, uh, MPI double here in your send call with, you know, uh, north type, south type, east type, west type. And you wanna do this outside of, outside of the loop here because you only need to do this once that uh, the types are gonna be consistent for each, for each iteration. And, you know, thinking a little bit more about it, then it, it, since, you're, since you're not actually allocating um, or, or since you're not actually packing data into send and receive buffers, you actually don't even need to allocate them. You can, you can save on that memory allocation in your, uh, uh, in your version of this, of this application. So similarly, you define these types um, for your receive operations. You would re replace MPI double again with your, your, you know, your north type, south type, east, west type. Um, and then in the unpack step, again, you, you could just comment out the unpack step, comment out the pack step, because your data is directly going into your um, into your two dimensional array that then you're using to, to perform computation on later. So that that's kind of the goal here is ultimately, you know, you no longer need the pack data or unpack data if you're if you're doing this with derived data types because because by describing the memory layout, you're able to uh, work directly in your um, in your two dimensional array, as opposed to, uh, you're allowing MPI to access that array directly, as opposed to manually uh, copying data in and copying data out for communication purposes. So Ken, there was a question about uh, contiguous data type, MPI type, contiguous. Is it necessary to use that? Uh, yeah, so so it's it's not really necessary, uh, as we as we said. You don't. You, that's what we mean by you don't want to use. You don't really need to use contiguous as your last data type. So so if the case here is you you're you're calling MPI type contig, and then you're passing that directly into MPI send and MPI receive, you don't need. That's you're not going to really see any benefit from that. You're better off just saying MPI double with count. You know whatever the, the size of your, your edge is. So this, this pack and unpack step, uh, particularly for the, for, the, for the regions that are already contiguous in memory, it's, it's really inefficient, but it's just to illustrate, it, we're just really doing this for illustration purposes. Um, so yeah, if you, if you instead wanna just give, you know, um, the offset into your A old here, um, and then use MPI double uh, uh, and the size here. That that would be that would be fine. That would be how we would recommend you do this most cases. Um, the packing step here is is really inefficient. So, but yeah, you don't you don't need to create a type contiguous for that case. But yes, for the as noted in the in Slack, it's the it's really the east and west that that are uh, um, the, the more complex uh, cases here where where you have this stride um you have this this stride in memory before you know it, it, 
before each more you know each of the significant pieces of data um, is located in your in your buffer. So that's 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 the that's the tricky part of this uh, of this exercise. Yeah, this uh, example just, uses. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just I just want to clarify a little bit. Um, so for the north and south uh, data, you're, you're not required to use a contiguous data type. Uh, you can, of course. Yeah, uh, yes. one, of the, one of the potential benefit of using um, type contiguous is that if the, the low level network, the, the hardware has acceleration for, uh, for if, if basically is, if you're using type contiguous, um, MPI has the chance to um, utilize whatever low-level hardware acceleration that it has for for continuous data if if something is available. Yeah. So for for example, InfiniBand has that. So um, if you uh, use type contiguous, you would, uh, MPI would would know that this is. Um, this is a continuous data, and and therefore is is able to le leverage that, and and it, this this might be might be more uh, might be more significant if if we're dealing with uh, uh, collective operations, where where the uh, hardware accelerated uh, uh, collective is available for uh, uh, InfiniBand network. So I'm kind of. Uh... I'm just kind of by hand doing the uh, um, one way you might do this. So this this is a uh, um, so we have this IMD function. So this is uh, this is a, a function I think that kind of gets data from your um, from your A old array based on uh, based on you know the coordinates you give it. So I could create MPI type contig. Using kind of the uh, um, you know the starting uh, offset in the buffer and uh, um, and the size of it, or I could do this, which is essentially saying so. Th this is my north. This is my north buffer. So th this is uh, hopefully I'm doing this correctly, but this is essentially just saying MPI. Okay, here's the location of my north buffer. It's contiguous in memory. Um, it's size bx um, and it's type MPI double. So that's this is another way to avoid the packing in this case. But if I wanted to create an MPI type contig, um, I could do that as well. Um, and if I was doing type contig, uh, I would still start. Uh, so the buffer I give to MPI would still start here. But if I said, uh, you know, I could. That's essentially what contig type gives you is you can, you know, that type represents, you know, BX MPI doubles um, start it. And then, but, but the, the type is independent of the buffer location. So that the, the buffer location is still, you know, is still different here, um, you know, for, for the north and south uh, edges of your, of your, of your data. But, um, <clears throat> But yeah, you could use conceivably the same type because you're sending the same amount of data, the same type of data, both north and south. So, so I think our example even might might call it like north south type or something like that. But that's uh, that's kind of what this is the modification you would see in your send call. Now you just have to make sure to create your type and commit it before you get to this point, so it's so it's usable. Hopefully folks are cracking away at that.
And if you're really having trouble, the solution is provided as the slide says, yeah. and you can use it for, for hints and stuff, but try, try thinking about it yourself first. Yeah, I would, I, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to reveal the solution just because again, I, I don't know if there's enough time for, for folks who are very new to this to, to, you know, fully, fully get their heads around it. And I don't want to spoil the, I don't want to spoil the result. So, um, but yeah, the answer is there so you can come back to it later. But I think at, uh, let me look at agenda here. I think at 12, we're going to switch over to the next topic. Um, so just, uh, yeah, keep cranking away and then, um, take a look at the solution later when you, uh, when you think you're, you've worked hard enough on it. There's a question here, yeah, uh, GPUs, CUDA buffers. So that's, uh, this is a good question. Uh, it's, it's a very relevant question to today's HPC systems. So um, can derived data types also be used to, with CUDA buffers? I mean, so predefined data types can be used with CUDA buffers, as can derived data types. Uh, and then the follow-up question there are no copies created on either the GPU or the CPU. And, and the answer is, uh, unfortunately, it depends. Um, so uh, GPU memory uh, being, you know, uh, more or less distinct from CPU memory, um, depending on the capabilities of the system, and that includes the hardware and the operating system and the MPI software, um, the, there, there can be extra copies. And I would say that for a long time and, and, and still today, there are likely to be extra copies, but it's getting to the point where um, where copies can be avoided in certain circumstances, um, and so and things are improving in that direction. And and also, uh, MPI and other communication libraries are adding new constructs and new APIs to make it easier to avoid extra copies in practice. Because you know MPI when it was designed. Um, you know, 25, 30 years ago, didn't necessarily have the foresight to know that there was going to be this, um, you know, compute accelerator in the node with its own memory system um, that people were going to want to, to use with MPI. So, so uh, things are getting better, but it's, it's, it's more than likely that you're going to see some penalty uh, uh, some copy penalty if you're using GPU buffers with MPI uh, uh, today, um, but things are getting better. And that's regardless of whether you're using derived data types or the basic ones, is it? Okay. Yeah, more or less. I mean, you're, you're, you're better off using contiguous just because that's typically the case that's, you know, easier for Im Im uh, uh, MPI and hardware implementers to, to optimize for. Um, but there is, I think, some support for non-contiguous, though it, it basically boils down to IOVEX, like they talked about in hardware yesterday. And IOVEX uh, construction often is, is expensive enough in itself that, you know, derived data types might just get packed, uh, copied uh, mm -hmm. before, before sent. Now where that pack occurs, you know, if, if you have good CUDA memory support, you may pack on, on the GPU as opposed to copying data to the CPU, that all depends on you know memory bandwidth and capabilities of your software stack and all of that. So um, again, it's it's unfortunately the answer is still really it depends, um, and that that's a that's an area that's still very actively being uh, worked on from you know engineering and, and research perspective. Yeah, there's a question here in, in the uh, in the Zoom chat. Are data types resolved at runtime? Yes, uh, it's up to the it's up to the application to you know, specify all, there, there's no way to kind of pre, um, uh, uh, pre-construct your data types uh, um, at compile time. It's it, that, that stuff all has to go through the MPI uh, library runtime um, system. Um, so yeah, everything, everything is resolved at runtime there. <clears throat> 
You could mention the type commit step also. That, that's where yeah, exactly. The time commit is really when the types are finally finally resolved. That's that's when you know resources are allocated. Um, you know, other other library functions are invoked. Uh, stuff like that. That's that's when data types are are getting you know uh, are getting resolved. And 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 again, type commit can be expensive. Hopefully, it's expensive because it's it's performing some optimization. Um, for that particular data layout, so that when it goes to goes to use it later, it it uh, it doesn't have to uh, uh, do that work again. You know, it, it it'll it, it knows what it's dealing with and it's able to to handle it well. Yeah, someone pointed to the MVAP uh, to GDR distribution, which uh, has has capabilities um, for for GPU derived data types. So yeah, that's uh, the the um, yeah, Babbage two uh, GDR distribution is, is quite advanced in its support for for CUDA memory buffers, um, or GPU memory buffers. So that's that's something that if if that's what you're working on, um, that's an MPI. If it's not already available on your system, might be one you want to want to try out. Um, we're working on similar functionality in in MPitch. Um, I'm sure the Open MPI folks are are, are doing the same. So. Yeah, the question here in Zoom again: uh, Does commit depend on the system we're running running on? Uh, for example, due to hints. So I don't I don't know if we have hint uh, um, explicit hints in the um, in the data type APIs themselves. But yes, it, 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 the commit will will uh, change depending on the system you're on, and that, and that depends on again a lot of things. It depends on the hardware architecture. It depends on the MPI software. Um, you know, because as we talked about, MPI is just an interface specification. The implementation of MPI differs from system to system. There's, there's different software stacks. There's different underlying uh, network APIs. There's different operating system um, uh, uh, APIs that MPI uses. So, so things, you know, while, while the behavior of the MPI function, um, you know, behaves according to the specification, the actual implementation can differ quite a bit from system to system. So something like commit, uh, you know, might uh, there, there might be no advantage to committing a, uh, an MPI data type on, on some systems where there might be a big advantage on others. Um, that, that, yeah, that all depends on, on, on where you run and, and all the properties of that particular system. Okay, so we're at, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I don't know if Rajiv, you want to uh, take over the share. We can get started on the next topic, or uh, yeah, we could. A few we more minutes. That. We can do that. Okay. Oh, I accidentally muted. I was just saying, unfortunately, I have to leave for the afternoon session, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hang around until until the next break and answer questions from uh, from my section as much as much as I can. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's noon, and let's get started with this next uh, portion. Uh, you can. You can continue the hands-on at other times during the day, and we have other hands-on. I think you, you won't really finish with the hands-on uh, during this uh, uh, during the tutorial. Uh, when, when we do the in-person uh, version of AdPesk, we have time in the evening as well to, to do hands-on, But and you could perhaps do it on your own in the evenings or uh, some other time. Uh, we have about 45 minutes to uh, to lunch, so let's cover half of one-sided communication, and then we will cover the other half after lunch. And we have one or two hands-on at least here if, if there is time, and, and we'll see how to 
you know, how to fit that in. It's good to have a contiguous, continuous block of time for, for the hands-on rather than five minutes before lunch and, or, or not. Okay, so uh, let's start with one-sided communication. Uh, so the basic idea of one-sided communication is to, is to decouple data movement with process uh, synchronization. That is, you should be able to move data without involving the other uh, process. In a, in a send and receive, you have, uh, it's a two-sided uh, operation where uh, the send sends the data but doesn't know where to put the data into. So there has to be a, a receive called by the receiver, which you know, a, a matching receive. So it has to match the tags and um, and, and, and the same communicator and, and then the same you know, sender value, uh, unless it's a wildcard. And then that receive contains the address where the data has to be deposited. Uh, but in the one-sided, uh, the sender itself includes the information about the, the call on, on the sender side includes the information about where data has to be deposited on the, on, on the target side. Now, that, that doesn't mean that one can simply write anywhere into another process's memory because that, that kind of programming won't be safe or uh, it, any process could just write anywhere is not, is not a good style. So uh, the, the, the way it is done in MPI is that each process exposes a portion of its memory that, is, that becomes available or visible to other processes that, uh, for performing this one-sided communication operation. So in, in this figure, it's the, uh, it's the memory shown in, uh, shown in yellow here. And we'll see how to create this memory and, and you know, how to define it. There are, there are four ways of uh, doing that. Uh, now, every process doesn't need to uh, expose that memory. Now, if all the, if all the one-sided was happening from rank zero only, that is the, the, uh, the target of the one-sided was on one process only, only that one needs to expose, the others could just pass null uh, out there. Uh, and, once that is exposed, you, you effectively have a, a global address space, not in the sense of directly doing reads and writes or, or loads and stores into that. You, you cannot just directly access the memory uh, in, in a programmatic way. You have to use the MPI one-sided functions, but you can then directly read or uh, write to that memory. And this just shows that you can do a, a put operation or a, or, or a get operation or another something called a, called a accumulate operation. Uh, so the, uh, this this figure just shows, you know, what what happens or how the data moves in the um, in the two sided in the send receive type of uh, uh, case. So in the send receive, let's say the the process on the right side, the MPI process on the right side is is doing a receive. So it, it will call the receive, which gets uh, enqueued into a uh, into a receive queue uh, uh, if, if if the send hasn't come uh, come yet. Uh, then the uh, process on the on the left side is doing the send, so it calls an MPI send, and what that means is that the data from the sending side gets sent over to the to the receiving side. Now, if it's a small amount of data, it'll get it'll just get sent over because uh, it, the implementation assumes that there is some buffer space. You know, the there is memory temporary memory that the implementation can allocate to keep this data. If this if the send is up is large and and what is large and small is up to the implementation it uh, and, and that can be changed and sometimes the user can change that also by a by a, a setting um, so let's assume that here the data uh, the data is sent and then when the when the match uh, on the receive side if the if the receive has been posted then there is a matching set, the send has matched with the receive then the receiver knows where the where this incoming data needs to be placed and it gets placed into the, uh, the memory buffer on the receive side. On the other hand, on the one side, it, um, the, the receiving side, which we call the target, and the sending side is called the origin here. The receive side does not call any data transfer functions. It calls, it needs to call another set of functions which are called synchronization. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that, but in, for the data transfer, it's the, it's the origin side does a, a put operation, and that put in it contains the information of where it should go on the other side, so that it gets directly deposited on the uh, on the target's memory location, and the target has no 
There is no matching. There, there is no there is no tag over here. In send and receive, there is a tag which which provides some uh, uh, matching. And matching means where where should the data be deposited? Uh, in the one-sided case, there is no tag. So uh, so this slide again just shows that uh, suppose. Uh, rank zero and uh, is doing a send and rank one is doing a receive in the uh, in the two sided case and and rank one is off doing some computation and because of which there is a delay then the send itself could could end up getting blocked until the receive is called particularly if the data is large uh, and 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 then the rank zero itself gets delayed uh, for that uh, operation whereas in the in the one sided case even if the other process is off doing a computation, assuming that there is some background thread or, or some way to enable progress in the background, that is the data can actually get, get transferred. The data can directly get deposited in the, in the target memory. And similarly, if it's a, it's a get, which is like the receive, that can happen even if the target process is, is, is off doing uh, computation. So, what do we need to know in MPI uh, RMA? There are uh, three or four things uh, you need to know or, or, or specify. One is how do you how do you create this remotely accessible memory? How do you make memory visible for remote mem memory access from another process? Then what are the actual functions for uh, one-sided read writes or um, updates and and other operations? Then there is a third thing involved, which we call synchronization. And what this really, what, what this does is um, it, it, it sets up a, a, you can say it's a window in time that a process says, okay, you can now write into my memory or you can read from my memory that it, that it is ready for that kind of operation. Because otherwise, if, if a process is writing directly into somebody else's memory, while that process is using the, the previous values in those memories, then there's a race condition, which they would otherwise have to resolve separately on their own out of, you know, out of band somehow. Uh, and there are other, some other issues involved uh, in that as well. Uh, so MPI provides uh, two or three ways of doing this synchronization. So it, it provides a safe space where a process knows, okay, this is a time where somebody could read right into my uh, memory or even for me to read right into somebody else's memory. And then it actually happens. And, the, and then the last thing listed there is a, is a memory model, which is a little more uh, complex and we'll, we'll, we'll get to it in the end about uh, dealing with when is the data uh, that, that is written actually visible to the other process? When is an operation completed? And you know what happens in, systems that are not cache coherent and, and so forth. There are some details that need to be specified. So one thing about MPI is that it's, it's all properly specified so you can implement it um, anywhere. So how do you, uh, how do you create the, um, uh, the memory that is visible to another process for one-sided communication? Uh, so first of all, by default, any, any memory that a process has is only locally accessible. So if you just, uh, either you statically allocate memory or you dynamically allocate memory and don't do anything else that cannot be uh, read or written to by another process so that is that is safe for you to use no, nobody else is going to modify it but it, the ones that you need to that you want to expose uh, uh, you have to create what is known as uh, in mpi as a window that that memory that you you expose to one-sided communication is called a, a window and it's a collective operation. And so a, a group of processes create uh, the window. So here in this uh, figure, it shows that each of them has, has uh, specified some portion of its memory uh, as the window and via a collective call. And as I said previously, not everyone needs to create a window, although they have to call that function. Some of them could pass null as the, uh, as the address or, and the size of it as zero. So that means they are not exposing anything. The others could be exposing. So if you have some kind of a, a master worker type of model where uh, the, uh, the rank zero has, all, has data that others need to read from, then rank zero could create that window with, with, the, with that memory and others, they, they don't pass, they, they pass uh, null and, and the size is zero for, for their memory. 
So what are the uh, functions for window creation? So there are four functions. Uh, MPI2 had just the win create, then the others got uh, added later, but they're relatively simple. The first one is MPI win allocate is, uh, you want to create a buffer and, and make it accessible. I mean, this, this function also allocates that memory for you. So you don't need to separately call malloc uh, uh, in this because MPI allocates the memory uh, for you uh, in, in this window creation function. Uh, the second one, uh, win create, is where you have to allocate the buffer and pass MPI an already allocated uh, buffer. That could be statically allocated or you could use malloc, that, that doesn't matter. But you are responsible for creating it and freeing it. Whereas in the first case, when you call MPI win free, uh, to, it frees that window object and it also frees the memory associated with it. Uh, the third one is, um, is a more dynamic approach where you, uh, you don't have a buffer yet, but you, you might create one in the future and you could create and uh, destroy and create more in the future. So it's a more dynamic model. So in WinCreate Dynamics, you don't attach a buffer directly. You, you attach it later on. You know, the the WinCreate Dynamic doesn't really have any memory right away. You, you attach memory to it later on and you can attach and detach dynamically. And, and, and we'll, we'll cover that uh, uh, later, but it's a more uh, dynamic way where if you, in, your, if in your program, if you're uh, repeatedly allocating and deallocating buffers, then this is a better approach to use. And there's a fourth method um, where uh, you can have MPI uh, create shared memory for you, not across the whole system, but on typically on a, on a single node where shared memory can be allocated actually. And there's a way to find out you know, which processes are, are, are on a single node and they can, so you need to create a communicator of processes that are on a single node and then pass that to win allocate sh shared. And that creates a shared memory region for that node, which branch on that node can both do one-sided communication and they can do direct reads and writes as well, direct loads and stores as well on that memory. And uh, that last one, I think Yanfei might cover it uh, in, in the hybrid uh, portion because that's like the MPI plus shared memory approach. And then and in this, uh, this part, we can, we'll look at the first three. So win allocate, uh, uh, so this is what the win allocate function looks like. Uh, the first one is the, uh, is the size of the memory region you want to. So it has to be a single contiguous region of, of memory. Let's say you, you've allocated a, a 3D uh, array of uh, integers, then whatever is the size of that array, and you want to expose that whole array, the size of the array you, you pass as, uh, as the first parameter. The second parameter is, is called displacement unit, and it's used in address calculation in, in, the, in the actual puts and gets. That is, where, where does that data get deposited? That gets scaled by, the, uh, amount, by this displacement unit. So, if you have an array of integers, say, the displacement unit you should pass as size of int. So when you're doing your puts and gets, the, the, the actual locations will be scaled by the size of int automatically. If it's a double precision, then you say size of double and so forth. So it's a, it's a relatively simple thing. Uh, the MPI info, let, let me, let's ignore it for now. It's a, this info is a concept in MPI where the user can pass some hints to the MPI implementation about what it what the user plans to do, so that the implementation can can optimize uh, certain things. In the simple case, we can just pass MPI info null, and the program will work. Uh, you you may be missing on some optimizations, but some of them are very detailed, and we, we can we we'll look at some of them uh, later. And the, the communicator is a, is an input parameter, so this function is collective over the set of processes in this communicator. Uh, and in base pointer, it, it returns the locally allocated memory uh, to you because this function actually, the MPI allocates uh, memory for, uh, for you. And the last parameter is the MPI window object. So there are, there are two things, the, the window and the window object. This MPI win is, is, is what is known as a window object. It's an opaque object. It's an MPI handle effectively. It's like an you know, MPI data type is also a MPI handle, MPI communicator is an MPI handle. So it's something that MPI understands, but every RMA function takes this MPI win as, uh, as a parameter. 
And the, the, the wind effectively has this communicator hidden in it. You know, it's because you have passed it to this uh, function. So this is wind allocate. Uh, the other one is, oh, this is just an example of how you would do it, which is, uh, which is trivial. Uh, let's say you're creating a, a thousand uh, integer, you, you want to both allocate and create a window out of a, an array of thousand integers, then that's the first parameter. Size of int is the displacement unit. That will be used in the calculation of the target address in the puts and gets that we, we'll get to that. Uh, info, you just pass it as null in the simple case, MPI com world, and you get a pointer to this allocated memory and you get uh, uh, the window object. So now this has been created. Uh, so this is the, this is the local memory uh, at a process that now becomes visible to other processes for the purpose of one-sided communication. Some other processes could pass uh, uh, zero is the first parameter. That, that means they don't want any allocation. They are just participating in this communicate, uh, in this collective function. So not everyone needs to allocate something. And then MPI win free fee, it frees both this window object and any resources associated with it. And it also frees the, the allocated memory here because if you're, if you're using win allocate, MPI allocates memory for you, which gets freed in the win free. Uh, the other one, uh, MPI win create, which actually was the only one at one time in MPI two, this was the the function. Uh, MPI does not allocate. That's the only difference is that MPI does not allocate the memory for you. You pass an already allocated address here in, in the in the base address. The rest is the same. So I won't go through the details. So here, yeah, in the example, there is a. Um, you know, you're, you're, the user is allocating memory. Uh, you can initialize it and passing it to, to create. Whenever the win free happens at the end of all the RMA communication that you do it at the, at the very end, uh, you have to free this memory that you have allocated because MPI knows at this point that this was a window created with MPI win create that MPI does not have to free that memory. Uh, you have to remember to, uh, to free it. Otherwise you have a leak uh, out there. So these are uh, two methods. And the third method uh, is MPI win create dynamic, uh, as I said, uh, that's it. If you, that is, if you have lots of dynamically allocated memory that you're going to create and free throughout your program, then instead of creating new windows for all of them each time, you can just create, use MPI win create dynamic, which does not take any memory address out here. If, as you see, it just, uh, it just returns a, uh, a window object without any memory attached to it to begin with. Then when you, when you want to attach a memory, you, you use MPI win attach uh, uh, to attach that memory. And when you are done with that, uh, you call MPI win detach. And you can do this any number of, uh, any number of times in the program. Uh, do I have an example? Yeah, here's an example. So uh, you create uh, this dynamically, dynamic window, it's a dynamic window with as such, it has no memory attached to it. Then you allocate memory and you attach this memory. Now you have uh, a, a memory attached uh, to it. You, you could attach other uh, memory segments to it as well. And whenever you're, uh, you're done, you, you detach that, that memory and then you free the, the window object. So this, this is convenient, particularly for the more dynamic, uh, types of algorithms, if you have graph data structures and, and, and so forth, this can be convenient. Uh, do I have, yeah. So that was the first part of RMA, which is the window window creation. Are there any questions or, uh, you know, I, I don't see the, uh, I don't have multiple screens, so I don't see the the chat or, or Slack, is, is everything answered? Uh, yeah, I think, I think most of the, Question and answer, but I think uh, one question do uh, I think we should mention it uh, is regarding the uh, performance um, um, performance of uh, of these four uh, window creation. We we okay then we we create and we create we create dynamic. So what what are the uh, performance uh, imp implications uh, between these three the, these yeah. three modes so so one one thing to that i i didn't mention is that the win allocate also gives you a since mpi allocates that memory 
it it automatically gives you a memory uh, a, a memory that can be used even with the lock unlock synchronization method which otherwise if you were doing win create you would need to use mpi alloc mem to allocate that memory i mean you an implementation is free to require that, uh, to have that kind of restriction now in, in some implementations it may not be required but the standard allows an implementation to say that if you are going to use lock unlock synchronization which we have not yet talked about but we'll get to then the memory has to be uh, allocated with mpi alloc mem or mpi win allocate so using win allocate gives you that for free and so i would recommend using it that way in terms of performance i, I don't think there's a performance difference would you agree Yanfei? uh yes I, I i would add um so uh if you if you think about this three model there's uh so from from mpi win allocate to mpi win create and mpi win create dynamic the more you're going, you're going down. You you have more flexibility of how the how the buffer is is created and and put into window and exposed to each to other. Uh, but the more flexibility it provides, it's it's actually um, harder for the uh, implementation to optimize. So if you uh, if all you need to do is create create a buffer and expose it at the same time, I would uh, recommend you go go with the MPI. We are okay because that offers the, the the maximum chance for the for the underlying hardware uh, underlying MPI implementation to optimize for that case. So if you don't need all this flexibility that the Win Create or Win Create Dynamic gives you, um, just just go with a with a simple simpler uh, mode. That will be that will be easier for for everyone, I think. Right. Is there anything else or should I go ahead with this? <laughs> uh, I, I think I think it's it's uh, this this is okay. Yeah. Okay. So so as I said, there were three things in RMA. One is window creation. We covered that portion. Uh, the sec the next is actual the functions for data movement, and the third is synchronization. So let's look at the second the second part. So there are three and three, six functions uh, effectively for, uh, for uh, communication. And the last four uh, actually do a, a, a reduction operation. They do a little, they're a little more, more than just uh, data movement. So let's look at them one by one. Uh, so this is an MPI put, but by the way, all, all of these, one sided are non blocking there, there, there is no block there's no blocking operation in that they are and, and they're they're not defined as i put or whatever uh, you know the, the mpi forum of course debates names quite a quite a bit uh, but it it uh, it did not de uh, define any of these as mpi underscore i put or it is but it is they are non blocking nonetheless all, all, all data movement in uh, rma is non blocking so uh, mpi put uh, takes the following parameters. So the, it's the address count data type on the on the or origin side, on the caller side. The caller is called origin. First three parameters are uh, the local memory from which it wants to put data into the remote memory. This local memory does not be need to be in the window. This this local memory is just private memory belonging uh, to that process. Uh, now. The next parameter is where, where should the data be deposited? So the next is the first is the rank of the target. Clearly you need to know which process it has to be deposited into. Uh, then the next three uh, parameters tell, tell uh, give the location of where the data should be deposited. There, there is no explicit address provided here. It, it is provided in, this, in the form of a displacement, uh, a count uh, and a data type. Uh, and this displacement is relative to the to the start of the uh, of, of the window on the target, and it's scaled by the displacement unit that I said was a parameter to the win create and the win allocate functions. So if that was a size of int, you know, in an integer array, you, uh, this displacement you don't need to give it in actual bytes. You can say uh, uh, a displacement of sixteen here would mean sixteen scaled by the size of that 
displacement unit that you pass to MPI win create and win allocate. That, that's the purpose of that displacement unit for this address calculation. So that gives a displacement from the start of the window that that target has exposed in the, in the win create or, or win allocate calls. And count and data type is, is the usual equivalent to the count and data type in a, in a, in a receive call. And, and this is the, the window parameter. Uh, so and any derived data type can be used both on the origin and on the target. The usual type matching rules apply, you know, that um, you know, it has to match the, the type signature. So the, the entire movement is specified entirely on the, on the calling side, you know, the, uh, the, the, which is called the origin. And that moves data out there. It, it initiates the operation. It's a non-blocking function. And the get is similar. It's the opposite uh, direction, where again, the first three parameters are the local buffer on the, on the origin where the data will be received. And this, of course, is private memory. This is, doesn't have to be up in the window memory. The window is only on the, in the uh, target of an RMA operation. Uh, the, and the same, the rank, displacement, count, and data type specify the target. And here, it's just the data transfer in the opposite direction. And the third one, uh, accumulate, is the same, but it also does an arithmetic a reduction. It's like an MPI reduce. It does an arithmetic operation on the data at the target. So you could do a sum to do an increment, and it does that um, you know, atomically. So uh, it takes one additional parameter, that's the MPI op uh, parameter here. That's the second last parameter. So it does uh, like, somewhat like a, a reduction, but it's, this is like a point to point reduction. So you can, if you have, a, if you're maintaining a counter or uh, somewhere, you can add to it directly by using an MPI accumulate uh, remotely. And you can also emulate a, a put with the, uh, with the op called MPI replace, which doesn't do any arithmetic operation. It just, it just replaces, but it does it uh, atomically. Uh, that is that. And then there is also a get accumulate. Uh, actually, let me, let me stop here before going to the get accumulates because the last three are a little, uh, uh, may need a little more explanation. So are there any questions here or, uh, or are they answered? They're, they're answered, yes. All right, so this part is easy. Now the, the next three are a little more, uh, they, they provide some primitives that are, uh, um, that are used in parallel algorithms. In the literature, in parallel computing literature, uh, they are used for parallel algorithms, particularly in a shared memory type of uh, context. So they are things like fetch and increment or compare and swap. Uh, these are primitives that you'll find in, in, in books and, and in, in your classes, or if you've taken a parallel algorithms class, th those kinds of primitives are, are, are used. And these are MPI functions where, that you can use to, uh, to you know, if your algorithm needs those, those kinds of primitives. So uh, MPI get accumulate, or let me, the next one might be easier to fetch now, but let, let's, go, let's go this way. MPI get accumulate is like a, fetch an increment, but it's a, a general version of a fetch and increment. So what it says is it combines uh, a, an MPI get with, a, with, an MP, with an MPI accumulate operation. And this is done um, in an atomic manner. So, that, so what, when, some, when a process calls uh, get accumulate, uh, the value at the target before the accumulate operation is returned in this buffer, uh, uh, which is the result address. And the, and the and the uh, the value that was in the in the origin address is the is the origin contents of the buffer. Those get accumulated into the target memory, similar to an MPI accumulate. And this is the, the atomic aspect of this is that if another process is also doing an MPI get accumulate at the same time, these two cannot be interleaved. You know, there's something intermediate cannot happen. It's either one or the other occurs in in some order. You know, one. One could get be first and another could be second or the other way around, but it, they cannot uh, be interleaved. So the, the get that value that is returned in the result address is the value before the accumulate operation happened at, at this target. So 
A simpler version of that is, uh, is what is called a fetch and increment. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's like a get accumulate, but it has a much, and much simpler parameter list. Whereas in get, you can pass any MPI op, you know, and, and any data type and, and so forth. So it's more uh, complex to implement for an MPI implementation. So the performance could be a little uh, less with this. If you just need the fetch and increment operation, which, uh, you know, which parallel algorithms uh, uh, require sometimes, you can call MPI fetch and op, and that could be implemented in hardware if, uh, if, a, if, if there is a hardware fetch and increment inst instruction. So here, uh, uh, there, are, there are restrictions on what the data type, uh, yeah, so all buffers uh, share a single predefined data type. So derived data types are not uh, allowed and that there is no count parameter. So it's, uh, uh, it's always one. Let me uh, admit this, I'm getting an admin, okay. Uh, there is only one, one type is used here and it allows for hardware uh, and optimization. So the, if you wanna do a, a quick, fetch and increment operation, this is the function to use. You may not need to use it if you're not doing parallel algorithms that require that kind of operation. Uh, another primitive that, uh, are, uh, that is found in parallel uh, computing literature is a compare and swap operation. And what this, this operation does is uh, on, on, the, on the sending side or the origin side, there, there is a value that you want to compare with the value at the target. And if those two are equal, then, then the actual data on the origin side is replaced, uh, is, 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 is placed in the target buffer. And the origin value of the target buffer is returned uh, to the caller. So it's a little, <laughs> it's a little uh, complicated to, to understand, but, but it is, uh, it's an essential primitive. So let me just explain it here. Where is the compare address? Yeah, the second parameter is a is the compare address. So that's the address of the of the buffer that is used as the comparison value. So this comparison value, it's a, it's like a single, and and there are restrictions on the data types that can be used, and the count is always one. See, there's no count parameter. So it's let's say it's one integer rep, uh, uh, represented by this compare address that is compared with the value. In, in the target buffer. And if those two are equal, then the, uh, then the swap op operation happens. That is the contents of the origin uh, address in a buffer that is, uh, that is also a single integer here, gets deposited on the target. And the original value of the target before this swap, uh, before this replacement gets returned to the caller in this result address. And then the caller can, can check whether this thing actually happened by comparing this the value in this result with what it what it has. So if you didn't understand that, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it is a, a bit complex, but the key to know is that this primitive exists in MPI. And let me, yeah. So what what's the what's the ordering of uh, uh, operations? Uh, as I said, they're all non-blocking. There is no uh, guaranteed ordering of operations for uh, put and get. So if you do within a particular synchronization epoch and I, what, what that means, I, I will get to, but if you call three or four puts from one process to another, they, they don't necessarily happen in that order. They can get reordered. The implementation will, will do it in the fastest possible way. So they, you know, if they take a different path through the hardware and one gets there before the other, that, uh, that's allowed. And then if you do concurrent puts to the same location in the same synchronization uh, epoch, uh, the results can be undefined. That is one could clobber the other. And there are, there are other restrictions uh, as well. Uh, the one thing is that accumulates uh, are, are defined to be ordered. And there is, a, there is a reason for it because some parallel algorithms needed, need that. And if you want to, uh, uh, you can always use a trick uh, with to to get atomic uh, uh, puts and gets by calling an ac accumulate with MPI replace. So if you call MPI accumulate with MPI re replace, that's like doing a put. And if you call MPI get accumulate with a no op, that's like doing a get. But since accumulate is defined to be uh, 
uh, atomic, these, uh, you, you, you get uh, atomic puts and gets. Again, you mostly will not need to uh, deal with this, but it's good to know that these options uh, exist. So this, prob this probably explains it a little better uh, since it's a figure. And what this says is, uh, in, the first, in the first thing before the first uh, dashed line, on rank zero, uh, there are two puts, both to rank one. One sets x equal to one, and the other set sets x equal to two. And x is originally zero on rank, rank one. And the, this is defined, the result of this is, is undefined, right? because as I said, puts can be, could ha could happen in any order. So at the end of this, whether x will be two or one on rank one is not defined. You know? So you, cannot, you, you don't know what the output of this. So you shouldn't write a program like this uh, because the result is undefined. Uh, okay, so the, now the second case is here you have on the target side, x is set, set to one uh, and the origin is doing a put where x is set to two and then it's doing a get. Yeah, it, it's trying to get the value of x into y. So again, this is undefined because these put, this put and get from rank zero can happen in any order. So you don't know whether this get will get the old value of x or it will get the new value of x. So you shouldn't do this kind of operation either. And the third one is, as it says, this here ordering is guaranteed. So here you know what the result is, is going to be. So uh, this case is uh, on the right side, X is set to two, all right? And uh, on the left side, this process is calling a get accumulate where it's getting the previous value of X uh, on, uh, into this Y buffer and it, it's doing an accumulate means it's incrementing it by two. So X gets incremented by two and the previous value of X is returned into, uh, into Y. And the second uh, just does an accumulate where it again increments X by one. So X is now three here, but because accumulates are defined to be ordered, as I said, puts and gets are not ordered, but accumulates are, uh, the Y that was returned in this first get accumulate will be two because this will, happen before this, the second accumulate. Is that clear? Probably not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little, can, can, RMA is, is tricky. Shared, shared memory in general is a little uh, tricky. Um, are there any questions here? Or is everything answered, Yanfei? Uh, yeah, we're, we're good on the, on the questions. Okay. Okay, we have about five minutes to the lunch break. Let, let, uh, let's move on to the next part. So we covered window creation and we create co covered data movement. And the third part is uh, RMA uh, synchronization uh, model. So in addition, you need to use some synchronization function. Why do you need to, uh, why need to call is, you need to know when um, a process is ready for the read write operations. You can't just willy-nilly write into somebody's memory because otherwise you don't have a, well-defined uh, algorithm. So there is a way for uh, uh, processes to indicate that they're, they're, they're ready. And, they, you, and you also need to know when is this operation complete? As I said, they are non-blocking operations. And uh, when do they complete? When do they complete on the origin side? When do they complete on the target side? You, you, need, you need to know that. So all that is, uh, all that is uh, defined by the synchronization function. So the, the simplest one, uh, is uh, is called a fence synchronization. It's called MPI win, win fence. Uh, it is collective function and it's collective over all the processes that were part of the communicator that is associated with this window object. When this window was created, you passed a communicator to that function, right? The, it could have been MPI com world, which means everybody in the MPI uh, job. Then this fence will become uh, uh, collective over the whole set of processes. So the, uh, you need to, in this model, you need to bracket the RMA operations with, uh, with, a, with a fence call. You could have any number of these RMA operations between the two, two fences. So the first fence says that uh, it's collective. So everybody has to reach there and call it. But once that 
returns, it means that the other, proce other processes are ready for one-sided operations to their windows if they have exposed a window. And then you can do your puts and gets and, and accumulates or, or any of them. And when you call the next fence is when these operations are complete. And, and they're complete both at the, at the origin side and at the target side. So at the end of the second fence is, it's, is when you know that all the data has been moved and, and, and now the other process can start operating on that data and, and the origin process can overwrite that buffer that it had used because suppose it was doing a put and it, it means that data has gone away. It's gone, it's sent, I can, you know, I can overwrite it, I can reuse that, that buffer. So this is a fence model. It is, um, it's easy to understand because it's, you know, you're, it's, it's very clean, you, know, you just call it fence. The drawback is that it is synchronizing across this whole window, uh, this whole set of processes in, in the window. So if you are, um, uh, if you have a thousand MPI ranks and you call MPI win fence, then it's synchronizing across all thousand. Whereas your communication may be among nearest neighbors. You know, you might be doing puts and gets just like in our stencil computation, we are doing communication just with our north, south, east, west neighbors. We don't care what's happening elsewhere, right? So the, it's a little unnecessary to synchronize across the whole, the, the whole set of processes. So it can be a little expensive uh, and, and to avoid, uh, okay, so here is a, we, uh, there is an example, but let's, uh, so we, we'll get to the example after lunch because uh, it's now time for the lunch break. But as you can imagine, what, what we were doing with I sends and I receives could be done with puts and gets. You know, it's the same kind of, uh, it's the same data movement, just different functions. And, and we'll get to that. Uh, we, we'll get to that after lunch. Uh, let me just see. Yeah, maybe this is a good time to, uh, to stop. And after lunch, I'll, we, we'll, we'll continue with the slides first and then go into the hands-on just because you need a, uh, you know, you need a block of time to uh, to work on the ha hands-on. So we have two more of the synchronization models to go through, uh, which are relatively quick, and then a few more other thoughts about uh, about progress and asynchronous completion and um, and so forth. And then we have uh, at least two or three hands-on if there's time. You know, you, you may not even finish one because it, it can take a, a bit of time. But it's the same example where we we'll, we'll add. Uh, one-sided uh, functions to it. So let me stop here and we have a one hour uh, lunch break, but I want to uh, see if there are any questions, uh, of course.